Okay, everyone is in from the waiting room if uh, folks would like to start. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is the uh, kickoff meeting for our Food Scraps and Organics Collection and Diversion Working Group of the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management. My name is Katie Dykes. Um, I'm the commissioner at DEEP, and I'm really uh, honored and, and pleased to be joined uh, by uh, uh, Mayor McDaniel uh, from Montville, who's joining me as a co-chair um, of this working group as well as um, the many of you uh, participants, uh, municipalities who are participating um, in the coalition and who've signed on for this working group um, and, uh, and members of the public um, who've joined us uh, to follow along uh, the conversation today. Um, we're, we're just thrilled uh, to have a, a number of different innovators and leaders and experts um, at, uh, from uh, around, uh, around the region um, who are gonna be joining us um, to, uh, for a panel presentation that will take up the bulk of our meeting today. Um, we're just, this is our first kind of meeting of this kickoff group. As you know, uh, through the coalition, we, have, uh, we had a really successful um, kickoff meeting a few weeks ago and identified um, through the responses that we received from uh, all of our municipal partners um, in this effort, uh, we identified four different topic areas uh, that folks want to dig into. Um, in addition to organics, which we're talking about today, uh, there's a working group on extended producer responsibility um, that met yesterday, and we have uh, working group meetings coming up um, next week on um, increasing uh, recycling and unit-based pricing. And so, um, but really thrilled about uh, the, the response we've had and the enthusiasm uh, for this topic, which was identified in our survey as the one um, that the most municipalities were really interested in. And um, so I, I'm really excited. I, I wanna turn over the mic for a moment to Mayor McDaniel. I know um, in Montville and working with Scara, um, he's been uh, really digging into these issues and, and looking at options uh, for organics uh, uh, program um, in, in his town. And so, uh, Mayor, maybe you want to say a few words uh, uh, to, as we uh, do this kickoff here. Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner. And, um, you know, I, I was excited to be uh, asked um, to join you with, with this working group um, because it's kind of a little bit near and dear to my heart. We're working with Scara to uh, develop a pilot for organics waste composting right now. So um, we're awaiting our permitting and uh, we've had our pad laid out. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to show what can be done down here in Southeast Connecticut. Hopefully we can expand that operation throughout the state. So very happy to work with the group and I'm looking forward to some good information today. Terrific. Um, just one other thing I'll, I'll mention uh, before we really dive into the, to the topics here. Um, first, uh, we've had a lot of activity going on with the coalition. Uh, I believe it was uh, a week ago, we issued a request for solutions uh, to, out to the uh, broader public, to the stakeholders. Um, I, I don't know if, I hope uh, folks have had a chance to look at that. It's posted up on our, um, our website and uh, we can provide the link to it in the chat box here. Um, in that request, we kind of identified at a high level some of the solutions um, that we're interested in and exploring as part of the four uh, uh, topics in our in our working groups, um, and we really want to hear from uh, from the public and from innovators, uh, program providers, um, uh, developers, uh, haulers, from um, and advocates, and and really the general public um, about whether these particular solutions that we're looking at um, are the right ones, and and especially to to hear um, you know, particular concepts um, that folks have about um, uh, successful approaches that we should explore in achieving, in addressing these, these various topic areas. Um, we've also, as part of that request, invited um, folks who are responding to that request. Uh, if you have a particular idea or concept and you'd like to present to our working groups, um, think of it as like a mini shark tank, maybe, I don't know, but uh, we can have some fun with this, but, but we really want to make sure that this is an interactive process. A lot of folks have asked, you know, um, uh, the coalition members are municipalities, but um, we're doing these meetings all open to the public and we very much want to have this be a process where we can engage 
um, with stakeholders and, uh, and with innovative folks out there to learn about the best models that we could implement here in the state. So if you haven't had a chance, please do take a look at that request. We have, um, in keeping with our really ambitious schedule here, we've asked folks to consider making submissions by um, uh, middle of October, I believe maybe October 15th, um, but we are gonna consider responses you know, as we go. So if you can't make that October 15th deadline, the sooner you can share something, the better, um, but we're gonna, through this working group, as we get those responses, um, we'll be posting them on the website and then we'll be sharing uh, the ones that are relevant to organics um, with the member, the municipal members of this working group kind of pointing you to um, what we've received. And as you know, the overall goal that we have in this, in, um, this effort and in this working group is, is to refine a menu of options um, that we could pursue, either programs that are ready to go um, or things that we could pilot or uh, solutions we should explore, or even um, it, it, there may be some uh, legislative uh, tools that we want to recommend to the General Assembly. So, um, you know, that's the goal that we're trying to get to by the end of this year. And the responses that we receive to that, the request for solutions, we hope we'll, we'll make sure we have um, a really uh, comprehensive and, and robust sense of the best ideas that are out there and potential partners um, here in the state and around the region. So, um, so with that, um, I want to uh, turn now to uh, give an overview of our agenda for today. Um, as I mentioned, the bulk of today's meeting will be focused on presentations, um, so we can really uh, launch this discussion with a, a sense of some, some really exciting um, uh, programs that have been implemented successfully um, in, around the region, um, hear from innovators, and entrepreneurs right here in our state um, who are supporting uh, uh, organics collection um, and anaerobic digestion and uh, to really kind of give us a sense of, of the possible and also hear, um, you know, what are some of the barriers and, and um, uh, things that we need to think about um, as we try to scale up organic solutions in the state. Um, the, and then, so those presentations will take the bulk of the meeting. Um, we are we are hopeful that, um, you know, I, I, I know that uh, given the, the, uh, <laughs> um, the expertise of all the folks we're going to be hearing from, um, I know many, many of us are going to have a lot of questions and um, I, I, uh, my goal is, uh, I know, to ensure we have some robust dialogue um, today and that folks will have the opportunity to ask questions and, and, um, and have some follow up with the panelists. So um, the goal is after we hear the presentations that will um, um, open up for some Q&A and um, discussion uh, among um, our coalition members, the municipalities um, that are participating. I know that there are also many folks from the public that are participating and following along in the meeting today. Um, and so to the extent that we have members of the public that would like to um, you know, submit a question and pose a question for uh, the panelists, um, we'd invite you to do that in the chat box and then we can moderate those questions um, as part of that uh, discussion um, after uh, we've had the chance for our municipal coalition members to um, ask their questions. And then we'll have some time for a wrap up um, to talk about next steps and our schedule going forward. And, uh, and then um, uh, wrap up the meeting around 11 o'clock. Um, as part of all of our working group meetings, because these are public meetings, um, it's important that we also are providing a time for public comment. And so um, at the very end of the meeting, um, we will allow for that time for, for public comment. So um, our, our deep team will help to moderate um, those comments as they're coming in. And, and I, I think uh, we can go, go over the process for doing that on Zoom in terms of how to hand, raise your hand or indicate in the chat that you wanna ask a comment. But um, that's our goal. We are recording this meeting and we will be uh, uh, sharing that on our website. Um, and uh, so without further ado, let me turn to, to Chris Nelson or Robert Eisner in case I missed anything <laughs> in the housekeeping here. Um, Katie, I think you nailed everything. This is Robert Eisner. We did just in the chat identify that if you haven't added your affiliation after your name, um, please do so. You can just right click over your name and that will allow you to add what municipality or uh, regional organization or private entity you're with. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for the welcoming. Terrific. I'm just always amazed at how we've been able to adapt to uh, <laughs> public meetings using Zoom. So um, terrific. 
All right, well, with no further ado, then I'd love to um, introduce our presenters. Uh, we have um, Ashley Muspratt, who's from the Center for Ecotechnology, uh, who will talk about technical assistance, resources, and success stories. Uh, Bob Spencer is joining us, um, our uh, colleague from uh, Vermont, and who he's going to, um, he's the director of the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District, and he's going to talk about a real live walking, talking, living, breathing, successful organics diversion program um, that's thriving just, just to our north. Uh, Brian Paganini um, joining us, he's the vice president of Quantum Biopower, uh, who has uh, the, the distinction of um, uh, being involved in the, the development of the first anaerobic digester at, at scale here in Connecticut. So excited to have Brian with us. And Sam King, uh, president of Blue Earth Compost, another innovator um, here in our midst who um, uh, has been uh, involved in the development of a successful curbside collection program, uh, a business um, centered here in Hartford. And finally, we have Deborah Darby, who's the manager, a manager at Tetra Tech, um, who's going to talk about co-collection programs. I'm really excited to hear um, about uh, that, uh, that approach. So we've got a great lineup, and uh, we're right at 9.13, so um, we can turn it over to Ashley to kick us off. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Commissioner Dykes, for having me today and to the entire working group. It's really great to be here. Um, let's see. Is everyone seeing my screen? I dive yes. in. Great. Cool. So as the kickoff panelists this morning, I think my goal is to set the scene, um, aiming to demonstrate the major role that organics diversion can have in reducing the size of solid waste streams. I want to present some of the social and environmental and economic co-benefits that come with diverting organics, and then talk about some of the tools that cities and states have available to them for taking organics diversion to scale. So a bit about CET. See if I can, huh, come on. Slide advance is not working. Ah, there we go. Not sure what happened. So CET is an environmental nonprofit. For the last more than 40 years, we've been helping people and businesses save energy and reduce waste. We've been working in food waste uh, prevention and diversion for more than 20 years. Um, and over in that time have helped donate tens of millions of meals and have diverted over 150,000 tons of food from disposal. Here in Massachusetts, we helped design and administer the Recycling Works program, which I'll talk more about. And then through our Wasted Food Solutions initiative, we're working with cities and states across the Northeast and beyond. Um, so through that work, we advise governments on the design and implementation of food waste policies um, on investment in infrastructure. And then we work very directly with the commercial sector as well as institutions to implement strategies across the food recovery hierarchy. We've actually been working in Connecticut since 2013. And that work has been supported by the EPA and USDA, as well as family foundations. And we've had a really close working relationship with DEEP as well as organizations like SCROG and have uh, helped to divert about 20,000 tons of food waste from disposal. So in terms of, you know, reducing the solid waste stream, food waste can be a major, uh, major lever. So this is a chart from the most recent waste characterization study in Connecticut. And you can see that food waste makes up over 500,000 tons of the pie. And when you add in other organics, so for example, like leaf and yard waste, you're up to close to 800,000 tons. So if you recall, you know, with the closure of Mirror, that would result in a loss capacity of about 600,000 tons of disposal. So the point I want to make is that when you really double down on food waste, you can get a big part of the way towards sort of neutralizing that capacity loss. Another important note is that we've seen is that um, food waste tends to be one of the major contaminants in recycling streams. So entities that start diverting organics tend to see an increase in the quality and quantity of their recycling. So that's a nice kind of knock on benefit to organics diversion that further reduces the size of your waste stream. But 
you know, not only does diverting organics address this sort of immediate pain point of capacity, but there are also um, countless social, environmental, and economic benefits, especially when you take a whole hierarchy approach to, to diverting organics. So for sure, any campaign should include education, awareness raising, and emphasis on source reduction. You know, the fact is a lot of the waste that's, the food waste that's disposed in Connecticut and across the country probably shouldn't have happened in the first place, right? Be it poor storage techniques or procurement or knife cutting skills, whatever it is, lots of reasons for residential and commercial sectors to be wasting food. Um, and we could do a lot better reducing it. Uh, Feeding hungry people is another uh, important strategy. Again, a lot of food that gets disposed is perfectly edible. And obviously we'd rather be feeding hungry people than landfills and incinerators. And then you have other great strategies like feeding animals and recycling options like anaerobic digestion and composting. And all of these contribute significant environmental benefits in terms of offsets in carbon emissions as compared to disposal. Finally, the, the markets, um, the end markets for all of these strategies are very real and thriving. You know, um, organics are very nutrient and carbon dense. It can be converted to compost that um, enriches soil health and improves carbon sequestration and or, you know, digested to produce renewable energy. You know, these are real and resilient markets um, that can be built locally and, and, you know, are potentially stronger than, than markets for other um, waste materials. So what does it take to achieve organics diversion at scale? That's the million dollar question, right? So at CET, we like to think about four key elements that, you know, when practiced uh, together, send a really strong and clear message to the marketplace. And by marketplace, I mean, you know, the generators, investors, and service providers. So the four elements are policy, infrastructure development, enforcement, and education and technical assistance. Let's start with policy. Um, you know, it's really exciting to see the momentum that organics legislation is gaining across the country. Of course, here in Connecticut, um, there's been a food waste ban um, in effect since 2014. So covered entities that generate more than 52 tons a year, so about a ton a week, um, and are within a 20 mile radius of a processing facility are required to divert their, their organics from disposal. In the region, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Vermont all also have organics disposal bans, and New York and New Jersey will be rolling theirs out over the next couple of years. I do want to point out that Vermont um, is unique in that over the last several years, they've been gradually expanding the coverage of their policy, and they've been doing that by lowering the threshold uh, for covered entities, the generation threshold, and eliminating the, the, the radius criteria. So actually, as of July of this year, all organics are banned from disposal, including those from households. And, you know, there's there's certainly scope for cities and municipalities to pass their own ordinances that could be stricter than what the state the state passes. This is actually a common way for cities and towns to catalyze more residential organics diversion activity. So of course, policy is only as good as your ability to practice it, right? So infrastructure development is also key. Um, you know, the presence of infrastructure really helps drive demand. You've got your private operators that are marketing their services and early adopters that become demonstration cases for their peers. Um, you know, expansive infrastructure development is certainly a long game, but there are things that governments can do to speed it along. So for example, in Massachusetts, the DEP has been issuing grants to incentivize investment in certain types of infrastructure. So most recently, um, that would be depackaging plants. Um, and so this really helped expand the scope of the type of organics that could be processed in the state. So now if you have a pallet of off-spec or spoiled yogurt or pasta or whatever, it can be sent to a depack plant the organics can be separated from the packaging material and can then be composted or digested. 
Um, you know, governments can also take measures to consolidate and streamline permitting processes. This, of course, has to be done to make sure that the plants are still, you know, safe and well run. Um, can also leverage existing infrastructure. I think this is a huge opportunity. Um, and a good example would be expanding leaf and yard waste facilities to receive food waste. Um, this takes training and new equipment, but you know, a leaf and yard waste facility is, is a really good sort of baseline system. Um, and, and similarly, you know, leverage out of state um, infrastructure. Bob before the call was describing, you know, the Northeast as a single waste shed. And in a lot of ways that's true. And, you know, we're lucky in the Northeast to have a real density of organics legislation. And that means there's infrastructure all around us in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York. Um, you know, don't be afraid to cross state lines and take advantage of infrastructure as you're building up your own. Um, and then finally, it's okay to start slow and build out. In fact, a lot of cities um, like New York, DC, and Philadelphia are building out community composting networks for residential um, composting. So kind of community scale plants that residents can bring their organics to. Enforcement is another key element uh, because it really helps to signal that a state takes the organics um, disposal policy seriously. And there are a lot of ways to practice enforcement. So one option is to have inspectors on a tipping floor, monitoring loads, looking for violations, tracing it back to the generator, and then issuing a, a warning letter or a fine. Um, so that's a punitive approach. Uh, instead or simultaneously, you could also you know, inform generators of the policy and offer assistance with getting into compliance. Example of that, a couple of years ago, CET and DEEP sent around co-branded letters to generators that we assume would um, be kind of meeting the Connecticut's um, food waste ban threshold and making them aware of the ban and then offering them free assistance with setting up diversion programs. And then local, local, local health inspectors are another really great resource and kind of messenger, right? They're already in direct contact with, um, you know, a lot of this food services, food service businesses you'd be trying to reach. So, you know, it's a great idea to equip them with resources and knowledge that they can then pass on to the businesses they're in contact with. And finally, the fourth element is technical assistance in education. And I mean that both for generators as well as for service providers like a hauler that wants to start collecting organics or a leaf and yard waste facility that wants to start receiving organics. Um, and I thought I'd give the specific example of the Recycling Works program, um, which is sponsored by the Mass DEP and uh, administered by the Center for Ecotechnology. Um, the program avails free technical assistance to any business or institution across the state. Um, it includes a really comprehensive website with um, a food waste calculator that's tailored to about, about a dozen different food waste sectors. Uh, a database where you can search for service providers based on your zip code or your need, whether you're looking to, um, you know, divert food scraps or you have food to donate. Um, and then we also have a hotline number that you can call and talk to a real human to get assistance, as well as virtual and on-site assistance. And there are a couple of characteristics of the program that I think have helped to make it so successful. Um, one is that it's decoupling the regulatory enforcement that the DEP is responsible for from technical assistance. So Recycling Works doesn't have any um, enforcement ability. In fact, we, we don't report any information to the DEP if we see someone out of compliance. Our role is really just to work with the customer with their interests in mind and help them do the best they can with their waste management. We're also a completely neutral party um, and that's help us, helped us gain the trust of stakeholders across the marketplace, be it a generator or a solution provider. Um, you know, we don't have any, we don't pick favorites or have loyalties to certain businesses. We just, 
you know, work with the customer, help them look at options across the entire hierarchy and plug them into the service providers that can um, serve their needs. So Recycling Works has had a major role in uh, jumpstarting commercial organics activity. You know, the fact is a lot of businesses, um, you know, don't see waste as a major priority, right? They're like whatever they're doing, is working and they don't necessarily have the knowledge or bandwidth to prioritize it. So to have free assistance from third party experts that can really hold their hands, make the phone calls to service providers, um, help train their staff can is, has really sort of catalyzed significant activity in the commercial um, organics marketplace in Massachusetts. The other thing I remind you of is that um, the commercial sector contributes about 50% of the organics generated in the state or the food waste generated in the state. Um, and, you know, there are fewer in number and bigger generators. So, you, know, you kind of get more bang for your buck when you focus on the commercial sector. And what we've seen is that haulers can use commercial entities, large volume commercial entities to establish routes and then residential households can kind of plug into that and that can help bring down the cost for residential organics collection. As I wrap up, I just wanted to call out schools as another important target for organics diversion. Um, you know, let's suspend reality for a moment and fast forward to um, that glorious day when cafeterias will be back in normal, normal operation and, you know, realize that a cafeteria is another classroom. Right. And so by fostering sustainable materials management practices in kids can really penetrate a lot of households across Connecticut and start to normalize organics diversion. Um, I've been in a lot of schools. It can be school cafeterias um, and it can be pretty depressing to see how much food is wasted. And this is, you know, unopened milk cartons or untouched apples. There are just profound opportunities to um, prevent, donate, and recycle food in schools. And there's a lot that municipalities can do to shepherd adoption of these practices. So for example, assisting with contracting or you know, ensuring that service levels are right-sized. So you know, when a school starts with diverting organics, um, you can downsize the trash service and reallocate you know, money that was being spent on that towards your organics collection bundle services across school districts and then direct schools to resources available to them about, you know, federal policies on offer versus serve, state and federal policies on share tables and donation and service providers for recycling. And the good news is there are a lot of um, schools in Connecticut that are already doing really great things that can serve as models. Um, through our partnership with Scrog, we're seeing a lot of interest among um, schools and implementing these programs. So a couple that I would call out are uh, the Wilton School District, of which this um, elementary school is a part. Woodbridge Elementary School has a fantastic donation um, and diversion to AD program. And Meriden uh, has a really impressive uh, education campaign around food waste donation. So with that, I just want to flash this resource slide, which I hope you will take the time to peruse uh, at, your, at your leisure when you get access to these slides. Um, I've included all kinds of resources here for you as um, government agents, as well as for your constituents on guidance for school programs, infrastructure development, commercial sector guidance, and so forth. So, Thank you very much for your time today, and I'm looking for, forward to your questions later. Um, great. Uh, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, Commissioner, it looks like you may be on mute if you are offering any comments. So sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so much there, Ashley. I'm so grateful. And I know we, I think there are uh, uh, folks have a lot of, of questions. Um, 
maybe if we have one minute before, because I know I want to, we want to get to Bob, but um, uh, before we forget, if there's any uh, kind of pressing questions that people have, maybe to add to the chat. But um, Ashley, one question I had is in terms of the Recycle Works program, how is that funded? Is that is that through the RPS? Is that right? Um, it is, uh, so there is a fee for um, disposal of waste at our waste to energy facilities and that fee goes into a fund from which um, Recycling Works and other sort of waste prevention and diversion um, efforts are funded. Got it. Okay, great. And do you have any um, stats you could provide? You don't have to do it now, but uh, afterwards, you'd be great to follow up in terms of the cost of a program like that um, and say the tons diverted, like to the extent to which you can kind of uh, highlight, you know, how that investment in, in that kind of program um, that can, can, you know, results in, in, uh, in, in tons diverted, for example. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to follow up with that info. I, I can say that um, since it's uh, implementation, um, we it's credited with directly diverting about 185,000 tons from disposal. And that's not counting all of the sort of indirect impacts that our outreach and education can campaigns ads. This is just direct technical assistance. Um, and I can get you more information on the costs. Um, and to emphasize that's total materials. It's a comprehensive um, waste stream program, not just um, organics. Organics. Super. That's great. And we will be posting all the presentations on our website. And um, and I believe your, your uh, email, uh, Ashley, I, I know folks are interested in being able to contact you and um, so if your contact information is in the, in the deck, we could maybe post that if you're comfortable with that. Absolutely. Yep. Great. All right. Uh, I think that's it for the questions in the chat. Let's, let's go over to Bob Spencer, uh, Executive Director of the Wyndham Solid Waste Management uh, District. Tell us about what you're doing in Vermont. Really exciting. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, um, really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you um, to Connecticut DEP and your working group. And I just wanted to let everyone know there's a lot of information in my presentation, more than we have time to go over, but you can peruse it later and follow up with me. And I can, if you want more information, provide it or clarity. Okay, next, Ashley's moving my slides. Um, this is our compost facility in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, it's very low tech. We've kept it that way. Uh, we basically have a front end loader and a screener. And, and, but we're now the second largest food waste composting facility in the state of Vermont. Next. Uh, we have uh, a very progressive hauler that has made this program really successful. Triple T trucking. Um, they collect the waste um, for the town of Brattleboro. They also have commercial collection programs. And I'll explain more about the materials they collect next. And then town of Brattleboro is the other partner. Next. There's a little shot of uh, Brattleboro, uh, an old mill town. Next. Um, the demographics are significant here um, in that we have enough density in the town of Brattleboro to make curbside collection feasible. Uh, we've got 4,400 eligible housing units. Uh, we estimate over 3,500 participate. Um, and we started uh, in uh, late 2013 and we had a pilot in 2012, next. There's the, the tons diverted. Um, if you look at the bottom FY14, at the organics, um, 222 tons, then the next year, 245. Then guess what? Pay as you throw went into effect as a mandatory program in Vermont. It basically doubled the uh, folks who would rather put their organics in a free 
curbside box, then pay $3 a bag. Next year, we went to every other week collection. Uh, again, significant increase. And it's actually, we're up to about 800 tons a year now. Next. The economics are basically um, 65 hours a ton for the town to divert organics, uh, the tip fee versus 110 hours a ton. So based on the 600 tons, it's saving over 27,000 tons. We're up closer to 35,000, excuse me, $35,000 a year savings to the town of Brattleboro. Next. We really have established a, a, a public private partnership. Uh, Wyndham Solid Waste, we, we do not collect the food scraps, we, we receive it and process it into a marketable product. As I said, Triple T Trucking does the collection. The town of Brattleboro has made this possible through contracts, which I'll talk about. And then we've had an amazing participation from our citizens. I, I was really skeptical that we could make a marketable product with a low tech facility from residential but uh, we, we do. Next. Um, as I said, we're, um, we're permitted from the Vermont DEC as a small food waste composting facility, and we follow their regulations, of course. Next. We take a large range of organic materials, um, including non-recyclable paper and cardboard. We also take some pet waste, and just about every type of organic material out there. Uh, we're all about diversion. We're not trying to be certified organic compost, which would um, preclude many of those items. Next. Then I'd mentioned the tonnage. Uh, this hasn't been updated, but uh, it's definitely been increasing. And as of July 1, as Ashley said, it impacted, uh, made it mandatory for residential. Brattleboro started with residential um, before there was even a mandatory law, um, but there are other um, sources of residential coming into our facility now and they are increased substantially thanks to the waste ban trickling down to residential as of July 1. Next. We have a seven year contract with the town of Brattleboro. It goes through 2024. Um, and same with Triple T trucking. They're, um, the two contracts are coordinated. Um, and you see there's weekly collection of single stream recycling and organics and every other week collection of trash. Every other week is a significant um, um, incentive for putting food waste out. Next. Uh, we don't need to go over the details of the contracts, but you have them if you're interested. Next. Again, next. <clears throat> um, next. We have um, also uh, serve up to four unit apartments. Um, the town does not collect from commercial institutional. Um, they rely on other haulers and Triple T has a significant uh, commercial institutional collection program. Uh, we have restaurants, food manufacturers, vitamin manufacturers, schools, colleges, et cetera. Uh, basically very widespread uh, across the ICI generators. Next. Um, Brattleboro, um, you can't see it, uh, but they uh, have a logo on the big green toter. Um, in fact, I guess you can see it on the far right. Uh, if you zoom in it, there's a ski jumper because there's a 90 meter ski jump in Brattleboro. And they use that as the logo for the program and branded it. But there's single stream put out with food waste. Uh, I've done curbside assessments and approximately 12 to 13 pounds per resident per week of organics. Um, trash is around six or seven pounds per week. 
Next. Uh, Triple T uses a side load um, uh, truck to collect um, the single stream in conjunction with the organics. Next. They then consolidate all of it at their transfer station in a 30 yard um, roll off and bring that load to us uh, once a week. And it weighs about 12 to 15 tons. Uh, you can see the large uh, component of cardboard and soiled paper in there and the biodegradable bags. Next. We also have um, two bread manufacturers that bring their material to us and it's actually very clean and makes a great, um, obviously, feedstock. Next. We also have um, one subscription residential collection company out of Keene. I've got a new one I'm meeting with this afternoon being set up. So that's a new um, source of uh, organics for us. Next. We also take the curbside uh, leaves from Brattleboro at no charge. Next. There's our loader, which you need a large loader to manage, you know, 5,000 yards a year. Next. There's a picture of our final compost storage area. We have been selling out of compost the last few years. The market has really become well established. And I must tell you, it takes several years, probably five years to really establish markets. Next. A lot of it's through donation and education to the schools. Uh, most of the schools have organics diversion like Ashley was describing. Um, but the, many of our schools also have their own gardens. So we uh, donate um, as much compost to the schools as they want. Next. We also have um, a series of um, commercial uh, vendors who, here's one of them just supplying it to a local um, hospital facility. Next. Um, we do have to test the product. We branded it as Brattle Grow. Um, I think it's good to brand your product, you know, give it a, a name, people get used to it. But this is the sort of analysis we do to stay compliant and also let the, um, the growers know what the agronomic quality is. Next. We have eight distributors. This is not up to date. Um, we don't sell in, uh, to small you know, residential customers. We just sell to um, our distributors. Next. Uh, there's some economics. They've already changed since this slide a year ago. Um, we're selling it at $25 a yard. Uh, most of the, ret the retailers are selling it $40 to $50 a yard. Um, it's been a significant revenue generator for us. And our compost facility is, is a profit center. Next. One reason we have a, a profitable operation is that our staff that operates our transfer station, we're located on a comprehensive site with a transfer station, um, taking all kinds of materials, overall diversion rate of 75% of everything coming in. So our staff are working full time running that facility and they can split off and handle the composting facility. And now it's up to about an hour a day so instead of having a dedicated full-time operator, we're able to um, integrate that work and we track the time separately. We do hire an outside contractor to operate our screen, although we uh, are shifting to a new model now, which I can talk about if someone's interested. Next. Of course, we do our pile monitoring uh, for temperatures, which is a regulatory requirement but we consistently hit the what's called PFRP temperatures of 131 degrees Fahrenheit. We've got our recipe down. We test for pathogens as a backup. Uh, but again, regulatory compliance is very, very important. Next. Um, the, the, this just shows that our, um, uh, our profit um, range here um, 
it's actually up closer to a hundred thousand dollars a year now. Next. And that's the end of my presentation. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Bob. Let me just pause there to see if folks have any questions. There's a lot in your presentation. Um, and I know folks will be eager to see that as well when we post it up on the website. Um, so any questions from some of our municipal members uh, for Bob? Okay, well, with, why don't we turn to uh, Brian Paganini is our next speaker, um, who's going to share with us uh, the experiences and opportunities to, from his vantage point as Vice President at Quantum Biopower. Commissioner, thank you. Um, just making sure everyone can hear me okay. Um, first of all, we, uh, we at Quantum appreciate this opportunity today, and I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, to speak to you all. Uh, so thank you, Commissioner. Thank you to Chris and Robert and the rest of the coalition members. Um, my, my name is Brian Paganini, and I am the Vice President of Quantum Biopower. I'm trying to get our slides to cooperate with us here. Pardon me one second. <clears throat> there we go. Um, I am uh, one of the members of the Recycle CT Foundation. I'm, I'm, I'm actually the treasurer. And I, I come to you today uh, representing uh, this team and this project uh, as it has been recognized both locally and nationally as a really shining example of anaerobic digestion uh, implementation within a community and a framework in a state like Connecticut that has been very uh, pro-organics recovery and diversion. I'm a local guy. I graduated UConn uh, decades ago, back in 2003, and I'm currently raising a family uh, uh, in the northwest part of the state in Harlington, Connecticut. So uh, I'm, I'm not only uh, a business owner and representing a team here, but also uh, just in, in as being a resident and having uh, my alma mater here in the state, uh, just intrinsically interested in seeing the state move uh, a strong organics program forward. So uh, here's a resource and here to share our story here at Quants. So again, thank you for the opportunity. I I'm gonna try to attempt to play a video here, but fully understanding that we're on a Zoom platform and it may come out choppy, I I'd ask that you bear with me. This video will be available on the slides uh, after the fact, after the presentation. Uh, but fundamentally, this video is going to demonstrate how in 2016, we developed uh, really the state's first uh, large scale commercial food waste only anaerobic digester. Uh, we can process up to 40,000 tons a year of food waste at our facility under a natural biological process that produces biomethane, biogas, roughly 400,000 cubic feet of biogas per day. And what sets anaerobic digestion apart is that through the biogas production process, we are capturing those methane emissions, and in doing so, we're avoiding CO2 emissions. So digestion uh, is really set apart from other forms of energy creation because of the fact that we're harnessing methane emissions and using those emissions to power a combined heat and power unit here on site. Um, for our municipal leaders, just to give you a sense of, of spatially how much uh, space this site occupies, it's roughly two acres of space. Uh, if you're wondering how large some of the tanks are on site, the largest tank we have in the backdrop is probably 38 feet tall. Um, the question we most often get is odors. Is this an odorous process? Uh, you can have lunch outside of our front receiving door and not have any problems. Uh, we have very sophisticated air capturing technology uh, at our facility. So we're very cautious of our neighbors and making sure we run a process. Uh, our calling card at this plant is, is our cleanliness. We do deliberately clean this facility uh, every Friday. So when you come visit us, you will notice a very clean facility, one that um, frankly, we take a lot of pride in. So the invitation is open to municipal leaders to come and see this facility, see what it does, see how it looks, see how it works. Uh, because there's really no um, no video or no presentation that can that can describe the anaerobic digestion pro process, unlike being there and seeing uh, it, it exactly how, how it happens. So nothing goes to waste on our site. 
uh, and everything is digested. And fundamentally, the way digestion works is we take organic substrates, in our case, it's food waste. Food waste uh, is purified and processed. We remove the contaminants. It goes into a very large vessel, in our case, a tank. That tank is free of oxygen. Uh, there are billions of microscopic bacteria that, that are consuming the food waste and producing methane. And that methane gas is upgraded to create a gas that is combustible and is uh, used as a fuel source for a combined heat and power unit. And our combined heat and power unit makes both hot water and electricity. Uh, the hot water is recirculated back into the digestion process to keep the facility temperate and to keep the process operating. The residual materials that are left over after the digestion process uh, are, you, are turned into soil amendments and, and fertilizer products. And we'll talk about a little bit about how that, that works, but it, it's a compost blend as Bob articulated that is uh, very attractive in the marketplace and one that we pride ourselves on, on producing to a very high standard. And again, it comes from, uh, from, from degraded food waste. So there's a lot of good organic nutrients within this, this soil amendment. And we'll talk about what that looks like. Food waste that comes from pre and post consumer sources, uh, packaged food waste goods, manufacturing waste streams, uh, bulk waste, uh, we process all comers, and that really is our uh, one of our keys to success here at Quantum is that we can take a lightly to moderately contaminated food waste load, we can purify that food waste and turn it into a digestible substrate, meaning that it, it's appropriate for digestion. So we take all comers at our plant. Uh, the plant was designed to take a variety of streams of food waste. It was also designed to take a variety uh, of reception trucks as well. And again, I'll, I'll attempt a video here, but, but realizing it's probably going to show up as a little choppy on your end. Um, the primary way in which we receive food waste is typically through, through box truck. Um, we have the capabilities through loading docks to offload uh, packaged waste goods through forklifts that are electrically powered from the electricity we generate at our plant. But the most common way we take in food waste is through compactors and trailers. Trailers come into our reception facility. It offloads its food waste contents into our reception pit. Uh, this pit uh, has macerators and augers and grinders that pulverizes the food waste and turns the food waste into a clean pumpable slurry that is, is, suit of, is suitable for, for digestion. So there really isn't a, um, uh, a truck or a transport vehicle we cannot accept at the facility. Uh, and again, looking back to the types of food waste we take, we're very capable and do take in a lot of uh, source separated organic materials that are generated from uh, municipal spaces, um, understanding that there's a level of, of contamination inherently in, in those sorts of food waste. Our digester produces two byproducts. Uh, the first one is biogas and, and biogas is the same chemical composition as natural gas, just a little bit lower of a methane concentration. Uh, biogas is a decarbonized fuel. And what I mean by that is it has a far lower carbon intensity than traditional natural gas and it acts as an excellent replacement to traditional natural gas for heating or for vehicle grade fueling or, or for pipeline gas. So when I mention carbon intensity, the carbon intensity of gas really um, measures the carbon that has been produced through the supply chain of creating gas, whether that's harvesting the gas, transporting the gas, or using the gas, whether it's natural gas or what we create, which is renewable natural gas. The carbon intensity for traditional natural gas is a little bit, uh, a little bit north of, of 80 grams of CO2 per megajoule of energy. Juxtapose that with the gas that we produce at Quantum, you can see the, uh, the, the, the green uh, negative uh, number to the right. Uh, the carbon intensity of, of digester gas is, is far less, mostly because it's locally produced and the way that we're producing this gas is through recycled means and not through uh, mechanisms such as fracking that requires uh, you know, some, some detrimental effects to the environment. So the gas we produce has a tremendous environmental upside and, um, and, and that's what sets uh, us apart from, from traditional gas sources. So that's the first thing we produce at Quantum. The second thing we produce is, is organic soils. We develop a product called NutriGrow, which is a soil amendment developed 100% um, uh, from the materials that are generated from 
here at Quantum. Uh, we've worked uh, in giving credit where credit is due uh, with our, our friends at Southern Connecticut State University within their agronomy lab to develop a soil amendment product to classify the nutrients coming from our digester and also uh, bring a, a final soil product to, uh, to an academic center that would initiate some growability studies for us to say, okay, here's where we believe the efficacy of this product lies. So when we're done digesting the banana peel, uh, the, some of the residuals from that banana peel end up uh, in solids that we recover from the residual products from the digester. We blend those residual solids with biochar, with other materials, uh, again, the composting recipe, and that gets compost in a windrow fashion here on our site. Uh, and then that makes a tremendous soil amendment for the farming and growing community here in Connecticut. And these are some of the results from some of the growability studies that we initiated with our, with our academic partner at Southern. Um, we saw tremendous uh, uptake uh, in plant vigor, crop yields, um, uh, uh, a, a less of an impact of dehydration for soils. Uh, so it just really proves a point that uh, organically driven nutrients that are locked in, in soils like we produce are extremely good uh, growing media for, for uh, the farming and growing industry. So we've worked really hard to, uh, to, to develop those academic partnerships. And the reason why I point that out is because um, digestion development is really a team effort. Um, it, it really is, is a challenging project to develop an anaerobic digester in any state in the United States because it touches on so many critical paths such as permitting, regulatory environments, um, business modeling, commercial applications, uh, all under the guise of, of food diversion and energy creation from digestion is all part of a fledgling industry. But we're very proud of our team here, uh, not only in Southington, but our extended team uh, who, who makes up some of our academic partners, such as School of Engineering at UConn, the School of Business, uh, our friends at Southern, whom I mentioned in the Agronomy Lab, and, and then our friends at Yale, and helping us to create some of the environmental policy around decarbonized energy and, and uh, helping us to assess some of these cutting edge technologies that are, are on the horizon for anaerobic digester processes. So when we look at the food waste that we are, uh, are, are bringing in here at, at Quantum, a lot of the food waste that we receive, as Ashley mentioned in her first presentation, is generated from the state of Connecticut's food diversion mandate. Um, what we know is that 22% of Connecticut's waste stream uh, is food waste of the two and a half million tons of waste that we manage. Of that, Quantum's capacity to process food waste is about 40,000 tons of the 500,000 tons of food waste that we deem to be capturable here in the state. But when you look at the amount of waste that we are actually uh, uh, generating from the food diversion mandate, it's only about 10% of our infeed here at Quantum is, is coming from the 20 miles around our facility. So this highlights a tremendous opportunity that we have particularly in, in the commercial space, to, to grab more organics, if you will, which will be the catalyst for developing more anaerobic digester capacity, which leads to more decarbonized fuels production uh, and, and frankly, more uh, soils production, which really is, is the ultimate circular economy story uh, that we've been able to, to develop here in Southington and, and that we believe uh, is the future for the state of Connecticut. And we can certainly have a, a more in-depth conversation at the outset of the presentation about where our thoughts are. Uh, and we'll certainly allude to some of that here. We always look at the quality uh, versus the quantity of recovered organics. Um, obviously, we like to see organics that are of high quality, meaning generally free from contaminants and grits versus a lot of food waste. Because sometimes when we're trying to generate a lot of capital organics, uh, occasionally the quality suffers. We like high quality organics in, in, in uh, digester applications because it creates a higher probability to reuse and, and create soils from those organics. Typically biogas production is higher when we have a higher grade of, of, of inbound organics and there's less of a risk for operational upsets and, and, and uh, equipment breakage um, because of, of grit and other things that we don't want to have in our digester. 
Sometimes we question, and, and this is uh, certainly something that we've pondered as the state looks to take this next step is, if we're looking to, to, to gain larger volumes of, of, of organics uh, through maybe transfer station side recovery, and we'll kind of look at what that looks like in the next slide, we're always cognizant of, of making sure quality does not suffer, um, nor is the impact downstream after the digestion process uh, impacted from creating soils from maybe less quality or moderate quality organics. And there's process considerations that we always have to take into consideration when we deploy digest for infrastructure to making sure that we can achieve methane production uh, while we're per potentially processing lower quality organics. <laughs> So while we are not haulers at Quantum, we do have an opinion about the, the sorts of food waste that are out there because it has such an impact on how we deploy anaerobic digester technology. And, and not to steal the thunder of our, of our next presenters, but there are a few ways to recover food waste from a mixed waste stream. There's obviously transfer station side recovery, which essentially is uh, we have trash, trash goes to a transfer station, and we implement um, mechanized equipment to scrub, squeeze, or process food waste from a mixed waste stream, and that, that food waste goes to anaerobic digestion. These are typically lower to moderate quality organics. Um, there is definitely a higher volume of recovery, uh, and there's a, a certain amount of operational ease because we can simply plug and play uh, these scrubbing systems into transfer station infrastructure. But the question becomes, at what cost are we scrubbing those, uh, those, those tons of food waste out of the waste stream? And what is the quality of those tons? Uh, we question what the soil reusable quality is. We think there's an opportunity to explore this. Uh, and that's part of the recommendation that, that we at Quanta make is, is, is analyzing and assessing what the opportunity for reuse of these soil products would be from organics that come from a transfer station side separation program. Uh, and we're actively doing some work with our academic partners in, in assessing this. Uh, the next opportunity for municipal diversion is obviously curbside collection. And, and what that involves is, as we all know, adding a third bin at the curb uh, and asking uh, our hauling partners, and in some cases the municipality, to put a second truck on the road to collect those, uh, those separated tons and bringing those tons of food waste into an anaerobic digester or another commercial recycling facility like a composting facility. These organics are, are typically higher quality, um, however, requires new logistics such as trucks uh, and, and toters and definitely a level of education and outreach to, to deploy these programs. Uh, and, and we've seen uh, a variety of efficacy and quality over time with these sorts of programs. This model is being done very, very well in the Italian marketplace. Uh, the, the Italians have really perfected a curbside model, uh, but the, the model of collection in some European countries uh, and, and the infrastructure is very different than what we have here in Connecticut in the United States. And if you, if you want to reference and see a strong model of transfer station side separation, I, I'd point you to the, to the model in the UK, which is probably in the most closest to the Connecticut waste model uh, the folks in Great Britain have a model that is uh, is transfer station driven, uh, modeled heavily around energy from waste facilities, as well as anaerobic digestion. And, and the final piece is co-collection, which I believe Deb is going to hit on today in her presentation, which essentially means uh, issuing citizens a, a, a bag. And in this case, we call it a green bag. The citizens put their food waste in a green bag. The green bag gets placed not in a separate collection bin, but inside of their trash bin. Uh, that trash is collected in, in a trash truck and at the transfer station, uh, mechanisms identify that green bag and separate that green bag out of the trash stream and that bag uh, with its organics get processed at, at a facility. This is an evolving uh, a new model of collection and one that may fit well with, with uh, the direction that, that Connecticut is headed. We believe that there is a higher quality of organics in this model. Um, there certainly is an opportunity for more of a programmatic rollout in municipalities here. Uh, it minimizes new logistics by, by not having to put trucks on the road. Uh, but, you know, I, I think uh, and I, maybe Deb can, can highlight this, uh, the efficacy and quality of the organics derived from these programs is, is certainly of question to ours. 
But no matter what, uh, in these three scenarios, there are opportunities for municipalities to engage in organics collection. And um, we're, we're very encouraged to, to see this conversation transpiring because we look at our host community in Southington uh, and, and there has been tremendous benefit in the town of Southington from, from our facility. Initially, we created 50 construction jobs over the year's worth of construction that it took to build this facility. We built this facility ourselves. So we're very familiar with what it takes to, to construct this, this plant. Um, we hired staff uh, within the Southington area and, and some folks outside of Southington who have since moved to Southington to be closer, who are part of the community. Uh, this facility is the cornerstone of the town's sustainability and recycling plan. And we'll talk about um, from an energy perspective what that looks like. And also we lease the town's landfill and have reimagined the landfill use uh, on their decommissioned landfill site, which was dormant for many years. Um, the tertiary impact of our facility is a little bit difficult to measure, but we do know that uh, several businesses, uh, a fertilizer company just south of us, uh, and some organics collection companies have, have evolved because of our location and, and frankly, because uh, we began operation. I think the most uh, compelling and, and part we're most proud of is is the energy that we produce at this facility uh, gets metered through the virtual net metering program to the town of Southington, where we identify five beneficial accounts for reuse uh, under a 20 year agreement with the town. Uh, it, it's enough energy to power the police station, fire station, uh, a couple of meters at the water treatment facility uh, and the municipal building. Uh, and on average, on a yearly basis, we're saving the town about 20% off the utility bill. So. For us, we just have a tremendous relationship with our host community. And quite frankly, um, we reference the town as, as part of our success and part of the overall team makeup here at Quantum. So we believe the future of digestion is very bright in Connecticut. Um, as we sit here today, there's only about 250 existing biogas projects like ours in the state of Connecticut. And there's not a large opportunity, excuse me, in the United States. There's a large opportunity uh, in the rest of the United States for many more biogas systems. Um, we're committed to, to four fundamental things in the state. And that is first and foremost, creating a landfill diversion model that incentivizes municipal food diversion, um, apart from strengthening the current commercial food diversion program that we have on the books. We look to assisting in some of the policies and standards for reuse of materials and digestate products. And maybe that's going to lead to co-digestion between wastewater sludges and food waste in the future and, and seeing how we can reuse those materials in certain growing applications. Um, but we're very encouraged by the progress around supporting biogas policy in the state, uh, such as implementation of renewable natural gas policies into the pipe and for transportation. And uh, finally, looking at the metrics of food waste diversion for assessing quality in the digestion process. We think uh, creating more of these organic streams will certainly be the launching pad for folks like us to take the cue to begin to develop more facilities around the state of Connecticut. And again, uh, I thank you for your time. Here's my contact information. Uh, looking forward to answering questions after the fact uh, and the door is open here at Quantum to folks in municipalities uh, looking to see what a, what a live digester looks like. Thank you. Brian, terrific uh, presentation there. And um, I know there's a number of questions that have come in from our municipal members in the chat here. Um, uh, Mayor McDaniel, yeah. I know you have you have one here. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk to that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I was just wondering if there were any opportunities for um, using wastewater sludge in your, um, in your process. Yes, Mayor McDaniel, thanks for the, uh, for the question. Uh, there is an opportunity for wastewater sludges at, at anaerobic digestion. Um, uh, we believe this is one of many opportunities for more digestible substrates in the state. Uh, I, I will give credit to the department. Uh, we are currently looking at ways of looking at how we can reuse some of the substrates left over after digestion for, uh, for co-digestion process. I think that's been an impediment for us uh, looking to, to bring in wastewater sludges. But uh, to answer your question, there is an opportunity uh, and, and we believe that it's, it's, uh, it, there, there's an unmet need in the state to, uh, to co-digest these substrates, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
And I know Diana McCarthy Berkeley had some questions around, uh, are there any lost fugitive emissions of methane in the process or storage? Great question, Diana. No, um, we because we're a closed process, there are, are no fugitive um, emissions. Uh, for us, uh, this is a completely sealed process from the time the food waste enters the bioreactor to the time it's turned into a combined heat and power. Um, so we have no fugitive emiss emissions here at the, at the plant. Um, it it uh, simply uh, for us, uh, because we operate under anaerobic conditions, um, we are, we're, we're not allowing methane to hit the open atmosphere. We're capturing those emissions and um, turning them into energy. Great, and another question. Oh, go ahead. Is that Diana? Okay, are you looking to build more plants and do you partner with towns to make compost collection no charge to residents? So yes, we are looking to build more facilities. We think there are opportunities within the waste shed organizations. Uh, obviously, SCARE is an opportunity, uh, BRFOC. Uh, obviously, there's opportunities in the mirror communities. Uh, with us being located in the center of Connecticut, we think there are some great opportunities and population centers for more digestion. Um, we have had a lot of conversations with towns about um, compost collection, curbside collection. We initiated a pilot with West Hartford a year ago to prove that uh, a curbside collection model could work. Since then, we've had um, probably half a dozen separate conversations and some pilots around curbside collected organics. Um, relative to no charge, I mean, th there, there is the way that our, our waste structure is structured in the state, there, there's, there's likely going to be a charge for collecting um, organics but we're always going to be, we always try to be much more competitive and far less than traditional disposal at uh, incineration facilities to incentivize folks to divert their organics. Okay, super. Uh, we have another question from your hometown in Harmonton. Uh, Terry Christensen asking, what is your intake capacity monthly? Oh, Terry, you're going to make me do some math here on a Friday. Okay, so our intake capacity monthly, um, we're about 140 tons a day. So that's a little bit north of 3,000 tons a month at our facility. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of, we would take in a lot of food waste. Just to give you a, a sense, uh, the average large grocery store produces four to five tons of food waste every seven to 10 days. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got a lot of capacity in speaking about municipalities for to take in a, a, a large volume of municipally driven organics for sure. And Stephen Lynch uh, asking, how is the digestate handled? So um, as we looked at in the slide, Stephen, we we take our digestate, we um, blend it and mix it with other other substrates. We finish compost it and that uh, product gets bagged and sold uh, to uh, folks who are big box store owners. Um, and in some cases, you've likely bought bags of our compost uh, through a third party brand, uh, but we, we will blend and mix and finish compost our digestate streams. And then I think our last question from our municipal partners, uh, Raymond Drew from Torrington asking, do you charge tipping fees? If so, what is your tipping fee structure? <laughs> hey, Ray, how are you? Um, we do charge tipping fees. Our tipping fees are commensurate with uh, other organics diversion out there. Um, you know, anywhere in between 40 to $55 per ton, maybe 60. It, it really depends on the volume, purity, uh, and an offloading process for organics. Uh, so again, um, uh, far more competitive than, uh, than disposal at, at incineration, and, and that's by design. We're trying to incentivize folks to divert through organics and, and uh, bring those organics to a recycling facility. Great. All right, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I think that's all the yeah. questions we have from our municipal partners in the chat. Um, and so let's now turn to Sam King, who's going to speak to us about Blue Earth Compost. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be here. Uh, thanks to the commissioner and everybody over at DEEP. I'm really, really happy to see that uh, there's so many people engaged with this conversation and that we can move forward with some solutions uh, for the state of Connecticut. Um, so just very quickly, um, you know, I'm very excited to talk to you today about uh, some of the research that uh, myself and an intern did 
over the summer about curbside organic collection programs that have been happening around the country. So moving forward, um, let me just get sure I'm on the right set. We go. Perfect. Okay. So uh, to give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from and who I am, um, my name is Sam King. I'm a co-owner of Blue Earth Compost. Uh, we have been diverting food scraps from landfills and incinerators since 2013. We're based out of Hartford. Uh, we're a small business that uh, started as a subscription-based collection service um, so that you know individual households could, could sign up to divert their food scraps, we would compost for them for them, and then they would get the finished soil back. Uh, as the years went along, we started to grow and added uh, uh, commercial and institutional contracts as well. Uh, an event service as a way to um, help make zero waste events and to, to promote what we were doing. Um, and I've gotten to the point where we are now diverting millions of pounds per year um, from the incinerator here in Hartford, but also from landfills because we know that still some of the, uh, the MSF in the state goes out of state because of uh, capacity problems. So, um, you know, in, in the state, we don't have any municipal contracts, but that's sort of the, the next realm that we're working towards. Uh, and years of experience doing this and and um, that's kind of what a testament to this to the project that um, uh, and presentation that I'll be giving you today. Um, before I dive into the reasons for it, I kind of just want to give you a little bit of the methodology and the reasoning behind the, why this presentation was created. Um, so we've been reached out to, uh, much as, as uh, Brian has and, and some of the other presenters, uh, from municipalities around the state asking for guidance, uh, what should be done, how do you initiate these programs, um, and Though we have a lot of experience, we don't know everything because we haven't spoken to some of the people um, in other parts of the country who have been doing this for years and decades. So myself and an intern embarked on a program to uh, basically survey all of those areas, ask the, the important questions about how they were able to get started, what the logistics of the program are, what kinds of success and challenges they've had, um, and just make that into a document. And that's kind of what this presentation has become. So. Hopefully this will kind of boil down some of those bigger questions and categories um, and, and provide some, some help in that regard. Uh, but getting back to the reason why, and you know, it's already been touched on many times, but just to quickly go over it, um, a, a vast majority of, a, a vast amount of the waste stream here in Connecticut, about a quarter of it is organics. So if we can get that out, we can start to provide solutions for uh, replacing the mirror facility um, and also uh, tackling the environmental justice problems that uh, are created by landfilling and incinerating waste. Uh, we've already talked about these, so I'll just move on from that. So just to give you a little bit of a survey of, of things that have happened within state, and these are some things that have already been mentioned as well, the, the pilot program at West Hartford, um, one that hasn't been mentioned, and I saw that Jen Heaton-Jones is on the call as well, so. Um, props to you for getting the, the pilot program going in Bridgewater. Um, but we've had two small scale pilot programs that were on a formal scale where um, uh, uh, private haulers partnered with the with uh, compost processors and their municipalities to do studies about feasibility. Um, and both of them ran for short amounts of time, um, collected data and found out what participation levels would be like. Um, the West Hartford one uh, ended uh, with, with positive results, but it wasn't designed to roll into a larger program. The one in Bridgewater was, there was a hope that there would be a, a, a density of, of customers still interested after the pilot program to participate uh, through their own economic means, meaning that they would have to pay to continue the collection. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do that at the time, but uh, as you'll see, there are other uh, examples outside of the state of, of programs like that being successful. Um, we have a number of transfer station programs um, where there is a container dedicated at a transfer station for organic collection. Um, a lot of them are in the southwest parts of the state. And again, thanks to Jen Heaton Jones. But there are other others in the state where those are just collected um, basis and brought to the composting facilities that we have here in the state. Um, our service, as well um, as a couple of other subscription-based programs um, in New Haven and another one um, based out of the uh, it's Redding uh, area, um, where they uh, they have programs like ours. We collect from 17 towns, mostly in the Metro Hartford area. But we also service Middletown and uh, a couple towns on the shoreline as well. 
Um, as as you know, we have quantum biopower because uh, Brian had his brilliant uh, presentation there. But there are other um, in-state capacity, in-state composting programs that are more of the traditional scale, whether they're using um, windrow composting or um, aerated static piles. We have New England Compost, We Care, and uh, New Milford Farms, um, all very well established and very used to taking in food scraps. And uh, as it's also been alluded to, we're also seeing some innovation um, at, at the government level and at the, the regional level with, with uh, SCARA, um, with um, uh, the DPW down in West Haven, thinking about ways that they can turn composting programs and in, in, uh, create composting problem programs where there are existing leaf composting piles um, and programs that also uh, just using space that uh, is available uh, to try and get these pilot programs off the ground and having a, a way to compost it in-house, which is a, uh, you know, it's a great way to, to do vertical integration of these processes. Um, obviously, we have uh, the CCSM, which is a MM, which is uh, we're very happy about. Uh, and then there's also some movement at the, the legislative level um, in the, the most previous section uh, before everything was, was shut down due to the pandemic. Uh, there was a bill on the table that would um, start to get the ball moving for pilot programs for municipalities that were interested. So uh, there's a lot of momentum moving in this direction, and that's great to see. Hey, Sam, this so, is uh, Chris Nelson. Your slide, you're still in your title slide. I don't know if you're trying to advance them, but it, they're not advancing. Oh, thank you so much for letting me know. Um, let's see why that's the case. I think I might just be sharing the wrong page. Uh, is that better? Can you see that one? Nothing being shared at the moment. Hmm. How about now? We see your title slide plus uh, like the thumbnails off to the left. Well, thank you for letting me know. Better now? Yes. Uh, this is the uh, pitfall of having so many tabs open at once. I didn't know which one I was sharing. Um, uh, we don't need to go backwards. So hopefully all the information was good there. It wasn't super, uh, there wasn't a lot of beautiful pictures. It was mostly just words. Um, so moving forward, um, the, you know, the bulk of what we see as uh, exciting movement and successful programs uh, in this regard are happening out of state. Um, and when you start to try and tackle the, the food waste issue, how are we going to start to divert organics uh, at a curbside level? Um, it, it's a pretty big um, undertaking. It's enough to, to kind of boggle the mind. So what we tried to do with all the data was break it down into um, three main categories that would sort of describe the different approaches to how you can, can uh, create a successful program and figure out what the right approach for your municipality is. Uh, those three categories are broken down in this way. Um, who organizes and administers the program? So is it gonna be done by the municipality or is it going to be done with the help of an outside entity? The second is who is gonna haul the material? Um, is it gonna be done by the, the municipal DPW or is it gonna be done uh, by a private hauler or is it gonna be done by sort of a free market of haulers um, where a, uh, any kind of entity in your town can uh, apply for a permit to do so um, but they're just required to offer organics as part of one of their services if they want to haul in your municipality. And then lastly, are you going to put a rule on the books that's going to mandate collection? Are you going to require certain entities, whether they be commercial entities or whether they be uh, residential entities or otherwise, are they going to be required to divert organics? Um, or are you going to do it um, as a process of just encouraging them through, uh, for example, things like pay as you throw? Uh, when you take those those larger those large three categories, um, based on the survey that we did, we found that that breaks down into these five different types of ways that municipalities have approached the food scrap organics program, um, and we'll just go through them now. And uh, each one of them is going to have an example of a city that is using that technique um, as, as a way to kind of see um, and so, and also for something for you to research later on um, if you like that sort of approach that that municipality is taking. 
So the first uh, approach that I wanted to get into is those that are organized by the municipality. They're hauled by the municipality, so it's done in-house, and they're doing it with an ordinance. So they have a rule on the books that's making sure that there is compliance. Uh, the, the example that I want to use is New York, New York. Their program started in 2013. Um, they haul it with the Department of Sanitation. Um, and it started uh, in, uh, you know, as a pilot program, as many of these programs do. And you, you'll see that as a trend. Um, but now it's offered in all five boroughs. That was pre-COVID. So the pandemic has put a pause on the program. They're working to get things back up and going. But before that pause, uh, they were diverting 42,000 tons per year. Um, so it is a, a, a fairly successful program. Um, at that time, uh, if we, the, the 42,000 tons is just uh, residential waste. They do have commercial programs as well. Um, uh, if we just talk about the residential waste, that's what they were seeing. Uh, they, uh, as, as you see in, the, in the, the bottom right corner there, they're using uh, a, a, a small bin I believe that is a 20 gallon bin. It has wheels and a flip top lid. Uh, those were distributed to um, uh, units that are uh, four or less, uh, uh, I believe four or less. And then they have much larger bins for uh, apartment units, which obviously there are a lot of in, in, uh, in that city. Um, let's see here. Um, I think it's, they, you know, if we start to talk about successes and challenges that they encountered, um, one of theirs in the in the very beginning was finding processing facilities, compost processing facilities, facilities that they could partner with um, that would be able to manage the waste and, and deal with, uh, you know, the 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 inevitable amounts of contamination that you're going to be able to find in these kinds of residential programs. Um, they've been able to to find solutions to that. Luckily, um, trucking is out of town and out of that city is a difficult and and it does add to their costs. So it's a, sort of an advantage that we have here in state to have um, easy transportation and, and also um, a variety of organic collection uh, places, but obviously we can use more. Um, and uh, prior to you know the, the, the suspension, they were doing quite well. Uh, another type of uh, example is those that are org organized by a municipality hauled by contracted haulers, so private entities, uh, but it's still done with an ordinance. A good example of this is Seattle, Washington. And this is actually the most successful organics program that I was able to find uh, in our study. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Let's, uh, we'll get to Seattle in a moment. Let's talk, let's talk about Cambridge Mass first. Um, so this is organized by a municipality, hauled by the municipality, much like New York, but they're doing it without an order. Um, and the way that they're able to do that is that they have um, been able to just rededicate resources. Cambridge was in a unique position where, um, you know, many of you might be familiar with Cambridge. It's a, it's a, it's a college town. Um, they have a very um, engaged community um, and sustainability is something very important to them. So they were able to, to reallocate resources from their DPW, uh, reassigning trucks um, and, uh, and, and, and be able to offer this to everybody in the town. Um, just by um, using those, re those uh, reallocated resources as well as some grants that they got from the state of Massachusetts. Um, also a very successful program, um, diverting about 1,800, uh, 1800 tons per year from their 27,000 households. And that started in 2015. All right, Seattle, come roll. Seattle is the most successful uh, program that we found around the country. Um, they are uh, really doing a quite a good job at making sure that uh, every, as many people are uh, participating as possible um, and also uh, making sure that they're uh, doing a great job with education and lowering contamination. They've just created great partnerships with the hauling community, with the uh, processing community, um, and have overall um, have done a great job. A great, um, it, uh, and a very important note for the success of Seattle is that they wouldn't be nearly as successful without implementing pay as you throw. Um, because they are doing it um, uh, with an economic uh, incentive, meaning that they are saying, if you use organic collection uh, at the curb, uh, you don't have to pay as much because you're diverting away from your trash. Um, they have been able to get um, a lot of people involved and, and doing it in the right way. So, you know, when you partner pay, you throw an organics collection together, 
that's really kind of the cream of crop of making sure that you're um, uh, reducing as much from the source uh, as possible. Um, uh, you are encouraging recycling and composting, um, and you're, you're making the most environmental impact. Um, so Seattle funds all of this through, um, through the collections of those pay as you throw programs, so it's not an additional cost to them to be able to add the composting. They, they, like I mentioned before, have been able to get these things started with grants, but and now it's all house. And an interesting thing about them is that they, they have 18 employees on staff for their city um, is doing compliance work. And that's not just residential, that's, that's commercial work as well, helping to, uh, to hold hands to make sure that programs are done correctly. Um, but uh, it just kind of shows what their priority is and, and how, what, their, what kind of resources they're willing to put towards making sure that we do things the right way. Um, so it, it's a good uh, kind of model um, for what, what we could do because the city of Seattle, uh, if I'm not incorrect, that that city has a population that is pretty tantamount to our state. Um, and uh, so they, they provide a good example. Um, on the right here, you see kind of the scoops card that they use. This is something that they drop off. It's, it's something that uh, I believe people in this uh, call are probably pretty familiar with seeing um, as you might've used it in your municipality at one time or another. Um, these, these, in addition to the education that they've used have been very successful. Um, and the next type I'd like to show you is that one that's organized by a municipality. It's hauled by contracted haulers, but they're doing it without an ordinance. Um, the example here is Falls Church, and this is a pretty interesting idea where they are working with uh, a compost collection company. And what they do is they subsidize the container and the first six months of service for all residents that are interested for, in participating. And then after that, um, the, the subsidy is taken away after that six months. And participants have to then pay for the program themselves. Um, but uh, because of the density and the, the route density that they've been able to pr produce, um, the rate for which the compost company would normally charge is far reduced from what the nor its normal rates would be. So they have about 640 households um, participating. So it's a, it's a much smaller pot, uh, size um, than you know Seattle, which we just which we just saw. Uh, but it could work as a good program for, for a smaller town um, um, or, or somebody uh, or a municipality that's trying to be a little bit more hands off with the program and not run it through their Department of Public Works so um, intimately. And then the last example that we found uh, when you look, look through those categories is uh, a municipality that passed an ordinance saying that the court that organics have to be diverted. Um, but at the same time, they're not going to pick a, a hauler. They're not going to do it themselves. They're going to do it as a free market of haulers so that anybody who wants to haul in the community can, if they do the proper licenses, they just have to offer organics as part of those services. And the example that I want to use here is Hennepin County in Minnesota. They actually have the oldest organic separation program that we found in the country um, running since 2003. Um, they started with a pilot program in, uh, in a suburb of Minneapolis. Um, just to try and get that data going. Um, and they scale it up to the point where they, they're almost uh, in every single town in the county. There's 45 towns in the county. They're in 35 of them right now. Um, and uh, and uh, it's, 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 again, it's a, a program that has worked out very economically well for them uh, in that they uh, are not having to um, do a lot of the administration um, that, uh, and, and collections themselves but they are also uh, having a lot of success with being able to keep these programs working solidly because they're able to collect those fees from the haulers to, uh, to fund the administration of these programs. Um, so that's uh, kind of, those are the five categories that we found uh, that different municipalities are approaching. And these are the trends based on those five um, that we uh, were able to pull out and, and, uh, and use as examples for, for how uh, municipalities municipal programs could be constructed here in our state. Um, the biggest uh, and, and most important thing uh, it, for us in seeing success was that uh, education was prioritized. Um, and there's a lot of different ways, the ways that uh, the methods that we were recommended by the municipalities that we were working with uh, was to make sure that, that clarity um, is, is paramount and also that you are engaging people in many different ways. Um, using online tools, um, 
uh, using uh, community forums when we're able to do so again. Um, you know, obviously we can do these online and thanks for that, but it'll be really nice when we can start to see people in face, uh, face to face again. Um, making sure that, that all materials are, are, are uh, work with the demographics of the area that you live in. Here in Hartford, uh, if we were to, to put together these, these programs, we would have to make sure that all our resources are bi or trilingual um, in order to, to try and make sure that, these, uh, um, that it's understandable and accessible to everyone. Um, and punitive measures, while important, should also be a last resort. We need to make sure that we're using education first and, uh, and, and doing the oops later. Something that we also saw was that grants are an important way to get these programs started. Nearly every single uh, program, if not all, um, relied on these to get started. So uh, we're going to be looking for, and, and hopefully that'll be part of the recommendations that are put forward as part of this process, that we need to start putting resources towards um, those ambitious municipalities that want to get these things started. Um, another piece of advice that we received was to start small, uh, making sure that the, uh, the materials that you take take in as part of the program um, are approved with the compost processor that you're going to be working with. Um, and at the same time, uh, making sure that you're not overly ambitious in that regard. You can always add things to the program later, but it's very hard to subtract. Um, that's something that we learned from Madison, Wisconsin, that ran into a lot of problems with uh, contamination uh, because they were too broad in what they were accepting at the, at, with their first pilot program. Um, the concerns of residents are important to this, this conversation. Um, they tend to be related to smell and the potential for pests. Those are things that are very mitigatable. And also what we need to have in mind is that this food is already ending up in a curbside collection container. Uh, what we are uh, merely asking residents to do is either put it in a new bag or put it in a new container um, in order to, uh, to, to do the right thing with the material. Um, very notable is that um, six of the municipalities that we surveyed are using pay-as-you-throw programs, and those are six of the most successful programs. Um, as Bob had mentioned uh, in his presentation of Brattleboro, Vermont, uh, some uh, of these municipalities are able to switch to every other week collection, um, and that's a really great way to uh, cut with trucks on the road if you're using uh, separate collection vehicles. Um, but also to make sure that more people are participating because nobody really wants to have their food sitting around in the trash for two weeks if they can get rid of it after one week. Moving on with trends, um, about 50% of the, uh, the municipalities that we service are using private hauling, 14% are using open hauling, and then a third are using in-house resources to do the hauling for these programs. Um, the average difference between MSW and food scrap tip fees um, nationwide with our survey was about $33 per ton. I think that we'd find here in the state that those might even be a, a larger delta, so even more of an incentive to, uh, to uh, implement these programs. Um, ordinances, uh, just, as, long with, uh, just uh, as successful as ordinances are with uh, um, uh, increasing uh, the participation in these programs, um, you'll find that uh, seven of the municipalities that we surveyed um, decided to implement those as well. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, uh, the compostable bag issue is, is something in compostable wares that need to be worked out with the processor that you, you plan to be working with as a municipality. So it kind of goes into that idea of starting small, you know, figuring out what are the most important things that we need to get out of the waste stream and then adding things later if we know that we can successfully do so. And then lastly, with the trends, um, we found that many municipalities are using 32-gallon rolling carts. Those are about half the size of a uh, standard uh, recycling cart that you'd have at the municipality. Um, they have the roll top, uh, the rolling um, wheels and a flip top lid. Um, there are smaller ones, as you saw with New York City, using about a 20-gallon container. Um, and I believe in Brattleboro, they're using a 12-gallon container or something in that size. So there is a little bit of... Um, uh, um, diversity in, in the cart size, uh, but 32 gallons was what we saw most often. So, um, you know, the last slide that I want to kind of uh, uh, close this conversation out with is that there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of different approaches for how your municipality can engage with this. And I think finding the right approach is about really nailing down uh, what the goals are for your municipality. What are the motivating factors? What um, what are the reasons you're doing it? 
um, economic sustainability, the politics in your town, and the logistics uh, of collection are all uh, important factors. So finding the approach that works for you is about answering the questions that are going to um, that are going to be most pertinent to your municipality. Um, this is this list that I put here uh, is just a starting point. Um, I could I could come up with a with slides and slides on the different kind of questions that you'd want to ask yourself. Um, but they're really just about nailing down what's right for your municipality because there is more than one way to do this, and there's more than one way to do this right. Um, so. Uh, hopefully this is a, a good start for you. I'm, uh, hopefully you were uh, engaged by this process um, and it helped to uh, demystify a little bit about what curbside organics is and what it could be for you. Um, and if you're interested in engaging forth um, and reaching out to us for more information, consulting, finding out more about what we do, um, we'd be happy to, to, to engage with you in those conversations. Super. Thank you so much, Sam. Let me see if there are questions in the chat uh, for Sam, one of our municipal partners. Um, I know Diana in Bramford had a question about um, whether you've seen any incentives like tax credits for residents or businesses who participate in these programs. Um, we don't. We haven't heard it about anything about tax credits to this point for incentivizing this, but. Um, if, if, you know, I can look back through our records and see if anybody had mentioned that, but I, I haven't seen anything about that, that approach being used. Great. Um, Jen, you had a question, it looks like. Do you want to ask? Oh, I see. Sure, I'll, I'll ask real quick. Um, the success of the Seattle, Washington, program you said was your most successful. What's the population density? Because my issue was that we are so rural. It's not that residents didn't want to participate or weren't um, bought into the program. It was the collection was not, um, it didn't make sense because of rural um, roads. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think, you know, that is definitely uh, an important factor to take into regard. And that's why I, I kind of thought it was good to show the diversity of different approaches for these programs to say there's not one way to do it. Um, what's going to work in a rural area is not going to work so well in a dense urban population. Um, Seattle is obviously that. Um, so they were able to, you know, pinpoint certain neighborhoods when they were getting started where they knew they could easily set up routes. It, it's a little bit more difficult when things are spread out. Um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, it was alluded to earlier that there is ways to kind of partner together um, restaurants, commercial entities, and schools and stuff like that with residential collections. So that's one way that you can kind of uh, make it work better for if you're working with a private hauler to do it. Um, uh, but I would say is, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna require a little bit more engagement with with the people. And, and you know, we have to think about the fact that a lot of people in rural areas are going to want to compost in their own backyard too and we and that's that's great we need to be um, incentivizing and and encouraging that as well so um you know what works in seattle might not work as well for a rural area um but the, hopefully there's an approach in this presentation or, or somewhere out there you know uh that might work i think you know if you were also looking to more inspiration i would i would check out what they're doing in hennepin county as well because like i said that's that's a countywide program and they have 45 municipalities and they have to take a different approach for everybody to make sure that it works. Well, that's why we went from a curbside pickup to a uh, municipal drop off. So they would just take it themselves. But thank you for your mm -hmm. uh, presentation. Okay, one other quote. Well, actually I'll hold this question to the end. Um, I know, uh, let's see. So we had, a, a, Diana, you had another question. If you want to mute, you're welcome to answer, ask the question yourself if you like. Hi, how are you? Sorry, it's a little noisy in my office today. Um, but just about the blue work composting, I know several of our residents participate in that program. Um, and it's very interesting being able to consider a town-wide service like that. Um, trying to find a way that we don't uh, ha have to have a, a charge necessarily that goes out to residents. So that was where my question came up before, looking to see if there was some type of tax incentive maybe to, to rebate them for participation. <clears throat> 
But one uh, resident actually had a question about making sure that plant waste doesn't get into um, get into the compost stream, in, in particular uh, invasives. And so making sure that you know on the back end you can get some great uh, compost from Blue Earth that you can use in your garden, um, and just making sure. Try, is there any anything set up to ensure that we don't uh, accidentally cause a problem like spreading invasives? which is something else the state has really considered uh, how to battle. Thank you. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, that, and it is something that has been brought up just before. It's a, it's a very um, important consideration. Um, I think it's gonna, it would really depend on the invasives and making sure that we work with um, the experts in those fields to find out what um, what the, uh, the, the the parameters are for making sure that they won't be able to propagate a compost pile. So just making sure that uh, you know what temperatures are going to kill off their seeds, um, and and making sure that they won't be able to to reproduce. Um, a lot of compost piles are going to be able to, uh, are you know done on the industrial scale are going to be able to to ensure that. Um, but you know, plants are plants always find a way. So it's, it's it's important that we make sure that we're working with with the proper experts in that field. Um, uh, to make sure that it's processed correctly. Okay, great. All right, well, let's, I think we have uh, Deborah Darby, who's our last present presenter for today. Um, we've had some great questions uh, so far. So let's, uh, let's turn over to Deborah. Um, she is gonna present to us on behalf of Tetra Tech about co-collection programs. Yep, thank you, Katie. So I'll be able to share a screen if Sam stops sharing his screen. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So here. All right, you should be able to see my screen and hear me. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, Deb. I appreciate that. Um, so Robert, Katie, Chelsea, Chris, everyone, thank you for inviting me to present today. Uh, my name is Deborah Darby. I'm manager of Organic Sustainability Solutions with Tetra Tech. And I'm here today to talk about organics like everyone else is here. Um, I'm just going to take just a couple of minutes to uh, just explain a little bit about Tetra Tech. We are the uh, nation's leading consulting and engineering firm focused on solid waste, recycling, and organics and resource management. We have a, a very strong, uh, deep bench of 20,000 professionals worldwide and a technical staff. We have offices, 450 offices across the, um, the, the world, and uh, we're really able to bring a broad range of technical services through staff local to every project that we're engaged in. Um, and you know, our, our firm is uniquely uh, positioned to provide guidance to our clients by leveraging our extensive experience to support solid waste management strategies. Um, I'm part of our North, Northeast solid waste team. We provide sustainable and innovative solutions focusing on resource management infrastructure and the environment. We work collaboratively with clients to evaluate how to incorporate industry best practices and the newest proven technologies into local waste uh, management. Um, I know my slides are a little dense, but since these will be available to you after, after this presentation, I'm just going through these uh, quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, just a couple of um, uh, project examples. Um, we do a lot of work in New York and throughout the Northeast, uh, working with counties and planning units to develop local solid waste management plans. One example here is uh, the, uh, with Ulster County in New York. Uh, we worked with them to help focus on leveraging the county's existing materials management infrastructure and the feasibility of developing alternative solutions. Uh, we also work and assisted Orange County, New York, on developing a new food scraps composting facility to be sited at their uh, uh, transfer station number one. 
Um, we completed an engineering report and a facilities manual uh, for this new food scraps composting operations. And we work very closely with the NYS uh, DEC. Uh, and then just one, another example, um, our team has a lot of experience with biogas production and working with anaerobic digestion facilities. We recently provided engineering services for this facility in New York State that uses both manure and other organics uh, for um, digestion and uh, generating of uh, biogas. So our, our firm has a lot of, um, it, the way that we're structured in a way that enables us to bring the best talent uh, to projects, regardless of where our staff are located. And just as another example, we worked uh, in Florida and recently assisted Lee County with their integrated solid waste master plan by evaluating uh, growth rates and expected changes to their solid waste stream, looking at facilities and other, uh, other assets. I know that was quick, but I wanted to try to keep us on schedule as well and talk about um, the co-collection program. Across the country, organics pretty much is 30% of the municipal solid waste stream. And we all know that organics is a recyclable that can be managed locally. Organics diversion and recycling organics that, you know, and I mean by recycling, composting, anaerobic digestion, and other types of, uh, of, of managing food waste, that this is a, this really creates the circular economy and, and benefits communities in multiple ways. But one of the key things that I think that this graphic helps us understand is that there are so many um, constituents, so many uh, stakeholders in this circular economy, and we all have to be um, aligned in understanding that the, the highest and best use for uh, food scraps and other compostables is managing it in a way that we bring end products into the market. And those products are bio-based feedstocks, biogas, compost. And what's important is that these materials need to have an end market. So when we think about the source separation of organics and the processing of that into um, uh, you know, composting and anaerobic digestion, we also have to think about how are we going to get those finished products back into the market so that we're really creating this economic benefit and creating jobs. So when people ask me, well, how do I get, uh, uh, you know, a, an organics collection program started, I really like to kind of look at the, the end point where, where how are we going to get that compost or that biogas back into the market you know, and, and, and look at it from a feasibility perspective to ensure that we're closing the loop and bringing new products back into the market and ideally kind of breaking our reliance on fossil fuel and looking more at renewables because that's what, that's what we're doing here. When we are trying to divert materials from the solid waste stream, we're really trying to look at a renewable market. Um, so I'm going to jump in quickly into the co-collection program. And I, I think what's important is that as counties and municipalities in the Northeast, as we face and are struggling with uh, disposal capacity issues, really diverting organics from the municipal solid waste stream is a pretty significant uh, goal that we're all, all looking to do. And, uh, and again, you know, without having um, landfills and waste to energy facilities, that are, um, uh, have the capacity, uh, we know that we're going to be facing um, higher rates uh, for uh, managing our solid waste stream. So it, it's really important that we look at organics as, a, as an opportunity for us to really get a handle on uh, managing our materials locally. So um, before I started with TetraTac, um, I was an independent consultant and uh, I was working with a Minnesota-based uh, company called uh, Randy's Environmental Services, a private hauler. And um, they actually started this co-collection program in Minnesota. So I'm gonna just talk about how this, how this co-collection uh, program got launched. Early in 2002, uh, Hennepin County, Minnesota started thinking about how can they get an organics diversion program um, as part of 
an opportunity to um, increase their recycling rate. So at a municipal meeting, uh, you know, this question got asked, and really two parties stepped up, it was the, the city of Wyzetta and Randy's Environmental Services, a private hauler, decided that they could partner to try to work on a curbside organics collection. But the trick, the challenge, of course, is, you know, how do you make it affordable and how, you, how do you design it and have it accessible uh, to the end user, the residents in particular? And feeding into this challenge is, you know, our you know, haulers even today are facing pressure to offer an organics collection curbside, primarily driven by uh, legislation. Um, but there's a lot, there's cost. There's really a cost for collecting organics. Organics processing and collection is not free. Um, as we all know, you know, there's, there's, there's containers, there's that added truck, there's processing. And then there's route inefficiencies as well. Um, Connecticut, I think Jennifer, you mentioned that, you know, we're very rural here, um, but we also have seasonal yard waste and primarily curbside organics this is a voluntary uh, uh, you know, participation at this point. But just stepping back with Wyzetta and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and Randy's environmental, um, they, what they wanted to do is they wanted to get it right from the beginning. So a lot of time and dedication went into developing uh, this solution, which you know, again was designed from the perspective of a hauler that has to manage that waste stream, but also from a municipality to make it easy for residents. And so what, what evolved over this really a decade um, is a program called Blue Bag in Minnesota, but it's known as the Green Bag Organics Program or Organics Co-Collection outside of Minnesota. And when we talk about collection, it is co-collection, it's organics being co-collected in the same truck as the solid waste. So as I mentioned, a lot of, you know, R&D, a lot of research and development went into this, uh, this program. And, and when, you, when you look at um, a, a dedicated organics, meaning if you're going to, you know, put that dedicated truck, that third truck on the route, there's a lot of inefficiencies. You've got scattered routes. You might have, you know, one house on a route of 1,300 houses that have signed up for curbside organics. And so that, that inefficient route um, is costly uh, to the hauler, not only with the addition of a, of a truck and probably a new truck, um, but fuel and trying to hire a driver. So there's a lot of costs involved with that. And what Randy's did when they, when they looked at um, that dedicated um, route and, and, and putting that third truck, it, it worked out to about, I want to say about $15 per household per month. It was really expensive to do that. So, um, and I'll say Jim is the guy that I work with at Randy's. He had this idea that he's going to develop a program where the organics will be collected in a compostable bag. And then residents just need to put that at the curb in the same cart as their trash. And then they could pick it up on their regular route. So, Randy's, so Randy's sanitation did this research. They could not find a commercially available compostable bag that, would, that was durable enough to withstand the compaction um, on a truck. So they went ahead and started to research and, and develop their own compostable bag. And this is how I got involved at the time. I was working for a biopolymer company called Metabolics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We were early pioneers of, uh, of, of bio-based of bio plastics. And, and, and Jim from Brandy's Environmental came to us and, um, and we started to get involved with the research of a, a very durable bag. But just sticking to my presentation here, finally um, the right bag got developed that could withstand the, uh, the compression of the trunk of the truck <clears throat> it could withstand any puncture and tear resistance so the bag would not zipper open and, and release the organics um, that had been collected. But it could withstand the cold of Minnesota winters, rain, humidity, and UV. And, uh, and the bag was also made from BPI or Biodegradable Products Institute 
certified the ASTM D6500 D6400 testing so that it would biodegrade, biodegrade at a composting facility. The program and the bag more importantly was all evaluated by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the MPCA and the Department of DOR, the Department of Revenue. And I, I put this on here because in Minnesota, the state statute defines a recyclable that it must be separate from the solid waste stream. Organics, when it's source separated organics is also classified as a recyclable. So when the organics is being collected in this particular bag, blue bag in Minnesota, the green bag outside, the organics is still classified as separate even though it's being co-collected in the truck. So it meets this Minnesota statute 297H for being uh, exempt from the solid waste stream, uh, the tax from, from the solid waste. So the program actually uh, enables um, residents to have um, a slightly reduced tax fee on their solid waste, as well as the, um, as the commercial sector as well. So it was just really important for me to add this um, bullet point to the slide because I believe that, uh, uh, you know, Connecticut Deep, that you will be looking at ways to make organics and organics programs feasible uh, for uh, the state of Connecticut. And this is just one, one aspect of the program um, that um, I, I think is worth uh, looking at as um, uh, classifying organics as a recyclable and then making source separate organics as having some sort of tax benefit to residents who might participate in the program. Um, so getting back to the town of Wyzetta, and I mentioned that at least 10 years of going back and forth with testing the program, finally, the co-collection program officially launched in 2012. And it's really easy. Residents uh, collect their food waste. They tie a knot in the bag and they place this particular bag in their cart along with their weekly trash. The hauler comes through and does their normal route. The bags are then brought to a transfer station at midpoint or to an endpoint like a, a MRF or a mixed uh, waste MRF where the bags are, are separated. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, it eliminates the need to add that extra truck, extra routes and containers. And I think what's more important uh, of everything is that the city was receptive to the program. Residents found it really easy to participate in this program. Um, neighborhood volunteers uh, encouraged other neighbors to enroll in the program and participate. And because this program is uh, voluntary, uh, residents are very good at source separating organics and keeping contamination to, to very, uh, very little contamination. And I believe there's some uh, uh, data available from uh, the early program uh, where uh, I think the contamination was kept to a, a 2%, which really worked out to being uh, twist ties or maybe even a meat package from, you know, someone making a, maybe a, an error in, in putting the wrong package in with the food waste. But because this is a, a voluntary program, people are committed to doing it and uh, contamination is very, very uh, minimal. But these images here just show you how easy it is to set up source separated um, organics in the kitchen at home, making it easy for residents, family and guests to understand how to source separate in the house. And again, the, uh, the bagged organics and compostable uh, papers, food soiled papers can be put in with the food waste and set at the curb uh, on, the, on the regular trash day. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the bag has e, uh, evolved into the green bag and the program is marketed as the green bag. Um, it's the same bag, just a different color. It's BPI certified to meet the ASTM standard for D6400 for compostability at a commercial or industrial composting facility. And today, um, 
48 communities in Minnesota with residential curbside organics collection, 42 of these communities have implemented the co-collection uh, method. Um, so this graphic here, um, I just want to walk through this. This is the process where residents and to a certain degree, some commercial entities uh, can uh, scrape food scraps into the bag, put tie a, uh, tie a knot in the bag, put the bag in the cart for the curb, the hauler does their, uh, does their normal route. Um, the bags are brought to a midpoint. And how, the, how Randy's sanitation started off uh, with this program, they started off with a manual sort where labor, their workers would uh, manually remove the bags from the tip floor at their transfer station or at the MRF. And over time, they uh, uh, um, automated this pre automated this uh, process from a portable sort line with two or four pick stations to now they're fully uh, robotic um, at their um, uh, mixed waste facility where they literally uh, have a robot that sees the bags and automatically removes the bags from the solid waste. And all of this happens uh, within a, uh, a, a 20 foot conveyor before the rest of the material, the solid waste goes through the uh, the mixed uh, solid waste uh, facility. And just touching back on, um, on what um, uh, Bob had said um, uh, with their program in Vermont with Triple T, I believe Triple T is doing um, this uh, uh, green bag program um, as a manual sort at their uh, transfer station before they bring the, uh, the bags over to uh, uh, Wyndham Solid Waste. Um, what's really interesting about this system, um, should a community uh, want to uh, start co-collection, the material, the bags can be sorted at a transfer station. Uh, a transfer station can be outfitted with a, a conveyor and a robot to pull those bags. And the compostable bags can go directly to a composting facility or, or they, they could go to an anaerobic digestion. Uh, for example, to you know, quantum biopower. Um, but given uh, the, the compostable bags probably will not go through a wet anaerobic digestion system because of the auger or the agitator, the bags would probably need to be ripped open and the food waste could then go into the wet anaerobic digestion. Uh, the compostable bags then would, would then need to go to um, um, a waste disposal. Or there's some other technologies uh, that can uh, pre-process the uh, organic filled compostable bags and the uh, compostable bag would uh, disintegrate in that process um, and at the end uh, create a uh, homogenous feedstock about 50% moisture and that material uh, could easily go into a wet anaerobic digestion. So what I'd just like to kind of wrap up on this particular slide is that there are facilities that would need to be developed to sort the bags and possibly to pre-process the, the bags with the food waste. All, um, all of it can be um, easily uh, worked through uh, through uh, planning and, uh, uh, and uh, looking at feasibility studies for your community or for your um, COGS or planning units. Um, some data regarding co-collection, on average, a household generates between eight and 12 pounds of food scraps and, and food soiled paper per week. Um, that's, that's pretty standard on a, on a national level as well. Some other states might be collecting as high as you know, 12 to, to 13 pounds of food waste per week. Um, but from the Minnesota data, uh, this is a pretty good average of eight to 12 uh, pounds. When launching um, a program, Typically, there's a, a 10 to 15 percent enrollment at the start of a program, um, and because of organics collection right now is primarily a voluntary effort, although uh, um, Vermont has their wonderful uh, um, universal recycling program where it makes it mandatory to have source, source separate organics, um, most uh, cities and, and states, um, you know 
this is really a voluntary program, but it makes it easy for residents to, to participate and to really focus on source separating organics at home with little contamination, again, when it's a, a voluntary effort. But hi, Deb, this is Robert, can, hi, Deb, this is Robert. Can you try and wrap up at this point? Thank you. Sure, thanks so much. Um, so I guess what I'd like to say then quickly about this slide is that um, this code collection program is designed as a municipal curbside organics program that can be phased in over time. All residents would pay and have access to the program. They just need to opt in. So if you have a, a citywide contract with a, with a hauler or if a municipality is doing a hauler, this program can be rolled into the solid waste program and be part of the services that you offer at the curb. And it makes it easy to phase it in, starting with particular neighborhoods or, or, um, or routes, and then phase it in over time. And residents just need to opt in. The bags do get uh, uh, shipped directly to every household that, gets, um, that's, that opts into the program. And of course, it can be offered as a subscription service, just like um, um, a trash hauling service might be offered by a private hauler. And the coal collection program is beginning to expand in Minnesota. Uh, I mentioned Hennepin County uh, was one of the early counties in Minnesota, and that's where uh, Minneapolis is within Hennepin County. But Ramsey and Washington counties are now working together. And St. Paul, which is the capital of Minnesota, is located in Ramsey County. They're looking to roll out the coal collection program, starting with 200 200,000 households. And, uh, and again, this is uh, uh, based on Minnesota state law that is uh, requiring communities to achieve a 75% recycling goal by 2030. And right now these combined counties are only at 53% at a recycling rate. So by adding organics to their recycling goal uh, that will help them uh, reach uh, their, their, their 2030 goal. So anyway, uh, uh, Ramsey, Washington County plans to roll out curbside organics, this co-collection model starting, um, I believe in 2022. Um, I feel like I was rushed, but that's okay. I'd love to take um, uh, questions from anybody uh, uh, during this presentation or even uh, afterwards. Um, you can feel free to reach me at, um, this is my email here. Thank you so much, Robert and uh, Katie. I appreciate presenting today. Thank you, Deborah. So, um, so exciting. I uh, take care of your presentation here and I appreciate um, all the detail that you provided. Um, so that uh, Deborah's presentation kind of concludes all of the uh, presenters. I've been indulgent here that um, our, our end time was uh, set for 11, but uh, I know some folks uh, it looks like have had to jump jump off of the of the chat, but we have recorded um, all of the presentations and uh, and if folks um, are able to go for a couple more minutes, um, I can hang on the, uh, here until 1130. So what my, I might suggest as far as timing is that if people need to go, um, uh, we totally understand. We'll go another 15 minutes here. Um, first, uh, a couple of questions for um, our, our presenters and then um, we'll open for public comment um, or public questions at the end. And if our speakers are able to stay with us um, through that time frame, I know that there may be some questions coming in from uh, members of the public who are participating here that uh, they may want to direct to you all. Um, before we move to the, the discussion and, and, um, and those public comments and questions, um, I'm going to just highlight some of our next steps for the working group. So we are going to be, um, uh, you know, posting all of the materials, including the presentations and the, and the meeting recording um, on our CCSMM website. Um, we will be scheduling another meeting of the working group. Um, I don't have the precise date yet, but it would be about two weeks time um, from today's meeting. Um, so I've made a ton of notes from today's discussion. Uh, and I know that um, it's a, a a little bit of a bummer to wait two weeks to really <laughs> dig into more discussion and reaction. Um, but uh, that'll be the time step for our next meeting. 
I will encourage our municipal members though that um, if you have you know spe like specific kind of solutions or things that you are really interested to to work on and follow up on as, as far as uh, refining and digging deeper into some of the different um, many many different um, solutions and approaches that people oh I forgot to turn my video on sorry um, have highlighted today um, feel free to uh, send an email to me. Um, at kd.dykes at ct.gov and that'll help us to really um, moderate and uh, set the agenda for a really engaged discussion in our next uh, meeting of the organics working group. And then, um, so let me turn to uh, any of our uh, municipal members that have some questions that you wanna ask um, uh, before we go to uh, public comment. There were a few questions in the box, text uh, chat box. Yeah. I'm trying to scroll back to see when they came in. Um, I think there was a question from Ginny Walton and Mansfield about for co-collection, uh, how do you uh, measure the amount of food scraps that are being collected since it will be weighed in with the with the trash? Um, so that's a that's one for you, Deborah. Well, that's a thank you. That's a, a great question. So. Um, um, so depending on um, how the uh, 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 trucks coming into a, uh, whether it's a transfer station um, or at, a, at an endpoint, the trucks are probably going to go over a scale. And, uh, and, and when the bags are separated, uh, either manually or pre preferably mechanically with a, a, a robot, at least for safety reasons, um, you'll be able to um, weigh the uh, the amount of organics, the, the amount of tonnage um, that might be um, separated, you know, in, on a roll off into a roll off or or you know a bin. Um, that would be the most uh, uh, practical way. Otherwise, um, you know, for for getting the program started, um, it's it's interesting to use um, kind of the rule of thumb where an average household is uh, diverting, you know, between eight and, and 10, 10 pounds a week of their food scrap and you can multiply that. That's probably the simplest way. Um, one of these uh, programs, um, we were looking to uh, uh, bring the material directly to a, um, uh, a waste to energy facility at that time. And uh, again, the, the trucks were going to go over a scale and the um, once the organics are separated from the solid waste, again, just being able to um, weigh the amount of organics that's being separated after the, the fully loaded truck goes over the scale. I hope that, that answers your question. Great. There's also a um, question interest in uh, worm composting uh, as part of these conversations. <clears throat> um, does anyone want to speak to the role of worm composting with these programs? I can just mention this briefly, worm composting is, you can do that really at home, home backyard composting, or even under your kitchen sink. Um, I do know of two people who are verma composters, worm composters, uh, one being Ann McGovern, who works for the Mass DEP. She is your go-to person for verma composting. <laughs> and Katie, this is Robert Eisen. I'll add that, you know, verma composting, it goes into the, the organics uh, management hierarchy. So it is, is it, it is an option and it may have a niche depending on what type of program a particular municipality would want to start. Um, and then another question that I had, if folks might be able to speak to um, what the difference in participation rates is and ultimately, you know, tonnage um, uh, managed through an organic uh, program where you have voluntary versus subscription um, uh, pricing mo or participation models. I'd be happy to uh, start off with that. So um, the difference, I think, you know, with with a, a subscription model, um, what I'd like to say is that, um, you know, mostly from a hauler's perspective, you're going to have, um, um, well, I'll just say, you know, again, the the route um, the route uh, efficiencies. Um, if you're if you have um, uh, a dedicated organics truck. And you're you're rolling uh, your your trash truck, 
uh, not only you're having multiple trucks on the same road, uh, but you will probably have um, at least every other house for organics or, or even more uh, uh, mileage between homes just to collect organics. Uh, you know, one example in Vermont or, you know, probably also for um, Connecticut with very rural, you're going to have very long um, drives between pickups. Um, a lot of mileage being added to the route just to get organic. So if you have um, a voluntary program, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking just with my co-collection hat on. If you've got a, a voluntary program and people sign up for organics co-collection and you've got the one truck coming down the road, you have the chance to increase the number of people who want to participate in organics because the truck is coming to their home anyway to pick up the trash and they easily can put their organics in a, in a compostable bag and put it in the same cart as the trash. So the chances are that you're going to have a higher uh, voluntary participation when co-collection is offered at the curb uh, as compared to a dedicated third truck coming through and, uh, and, and that would be probably, you know, through a subscription. So um, if I can, I hope that's clear, um, trying to uh, answer the question between voluntary and subscription. I, I think the other thing too with uh, voluntary um, uh, in offering co-collection, the cost of the program can be kept minimal because everyone will be paying for the program and has access to the program. They just need to opt in and participate. Um, so if everybody is, 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 if everybody's paying for the service, just like you would have utility services coming to your home, the cost is, is shared. So in, in a lot of ways, it's, 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 it's enabling uh, people who would not have access to this service. It, 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 it makes it kind of more equitable to bring organics to the curb. Okay, I'm, uh, this is uh, Sam. If I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just to, to add one thing to, to, to what Deborah said, I think one other difference between subscription and voluntary is that speaking from a subscription based company, uh, we give compost back to our customers. So that does increase the incentive for people to want to participate in the composting process because they get to see that tangible product at the end. So, uh, I, but the main difference is. I think it's about efficiency and it's about cost. You know, if it's a voluntary program that the town is sponsoring, then ostensibly the residents don't have to pay any extra except for through taxes um, to their to the process. Uh, if they're paying for a subscription, obviously it's coming out of pocket. So that's a different economic consideration. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Let me see if there's any other, I think we've, I think, um, gotten to a lot of the municipal questions and comments that were raised in the chat. Um, if you are a municipality that has a, uh, a question that you haven't had a chance to ask yet, you can unmute and ask your question. Maybe the easiest to do it, and then we'll shift to public comment. Maybe I have a question for Deb. Um, do the bats in the commingle Hi, Dad. Good to see you. Hi, Jen. <laughs> Does the bags in the commingle ever break? Because um, residents are holding on to them for too long and they're already breaking down. Do you have that issue? Um, yeah. So uh, again, um, uh, the this co-collection program, um, uh, I, I'm, I represent because they're a client of, of ours. And um, in my background in bioplastics, not all compostable bags are the same. And it has to do with the, the makeup of the biopolymer. And, and I can just tell you from my experience in watching this program, this co-collection program get developed over the last 10 years, the way that the material that's being used, the, the, the biopolymer and the way that the bags are manufactured, they're designed to withstand the compaction. So there's a lot of stretching um, and, 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 and movement in the truck that the, the seam, the bottom seam is designed to be very strong 
and then the sides of the bag won't zipper open. And that's primarily the, the, the problem with other types of compostable materials is that they, they kind of, um, I'm not gonna name uh, products, uh, but they'll either zipper or the, the bottoms will start to give up because of the, um, some of the, the material that, that they're made from. For example, um, if a, um, a compostable bag is uh, in a kitchen countertop and people are putting their food waste and uh, there's a, um, a, a particular kitchen countertop has to have um, air holes to enable airflow so that the bag won't collect a lot of moisture, that is, the, the bag will start to disintegrate literally right on your countertop. Right, so um, wait, I have that experience. It slows down anaerobic. I just wanted to know if um, in, in general, if they were breaking down and if there was that experience of them breaking in transport. Um, and then just, yeah, just in, yeah. in um, I'm aware of the time. So just my other real quick question is to Connecticut DEP. My, my understanding is that we have a regulation that requires source separation from the generator. Um, is this, if this type of program um, were to be implemented, would regulation have to be changed? Hi, Jenna, I sent that, that we, we, yes, we may have to do a demonstration or a pilot project approval and, and this sort of thing we'll look at long-term through the working groups is, are there regulatory statutory changes that we need? I think now we're in that sort of, what's the, what's the vision, what's the right move to make mode? Thank you, Robert. I, I wasn't sure if I had that regulation um, right, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and and I just also wanted to say that um, uh, you know the uh, MPCA and the DOR uh, uh, evaluated the co-collection method in Minnesota because again they have their uh, their tax exempt law uh, that uh, uh, recyclables must remain um, separate from the trash and and I, I think this is a little different from what you're you're probably asking Jen and what you're responding to Robert but um, legis the program meets. The, the tax exempt statute in Minnesota for maintaining organics, which is a recyclable, separate from the solid waste stream, even though it's being co-collected in that truck. And it meets that uh, particular statute. Um, so why don't we, there, um, um, if, oh, sorry. oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, but just that, to my, okay. Okay. <laughs> I could talk organics all day, you guys. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, this is like the this is uh, this meeting. I know. I wish we we had all day. Let me pause here and see if there's any public comments or questions that folks want to raise. Um, we'll uh, if you want to pop them into the chat. I know we're way over time, um, but we will provide for if folks don't get a chance to ask their question or make their comment um, to be able to email them um, to Robert Eisner. <clears throat> and Robert, I think you can put your email in the chat as well, so folks will have it, um, so that we can try to get make make sure that uh, if we run out of time, um, that folks will be able to provide their comments and questions through email. But anyone, any of our public uh, um, members today, do you want to uh, raise any questions or make any comments? Hi, uh, this is Rashi Yaki. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I am the CEO of Adrid Energy. We started this company four years ago. And uh, I think a few of you probably already know me, but we are building our first farm digester in Thompson, Connecticut. Um, we are hoping to get started, um, finish that construction end of this year, get that project going. Uh, that farm digester takes in liquid food waste. Uh, so we are planning to take um, 20 to 25,000 tons a year of liquid food waste. Um, right now, we are also planning the second digester, farm digester, which has been in the plans for past four years also. Uh, it's just taken us this long in Coventry, Connecticut. Um, that Coventry, Connecticut project, we is going, we're going to have a deep packager associated with the digester. And we have a deep packager that actually, Ashley shared the picture of the deep packager was actually Granville digester. Uh, that is owned by Adrid Energy. Uh, so we are ready to work with you guys. Uh, we have a deep packager and a digester system in Granville, which is a mile away from Connecticut border. If you wanna pilot something, start something, we would be happy to work with you. We certainly wanna work with various municipalities to supply food waste to our Coventry digester, which we are planning to build next year. So 
I just wanted to introduce myself. If you hear a couple of people talking about Adrian projects um, because we are launching a study, um, just wanted to, you to connect uh, the name and the face together. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Rashi. And I know uh, uh, appreciate you being on the call today and um, and maybe sharing that introduction through um, a response to the request for solutions. We'll make sure that we have all of that um, captured for all the working group members, especially folks who uh, may have had to leave early on the or <laughs> leave on time um, in our meeting today. Any other public comments? Okay, well, not hearing any other comments or questions. I just want to thank this incredible panel. I'm so grateful to all of you um, for putting together such incredible presentations for us. Um, you've really like launched a thousand ideas and um, very grateful for you helping us kick off this important conversation. So really thank you so much for all the time um, that you put into uh, informing us today. And with that, uh, we will wrap up our, our meeting today and uh, we'll talk to everybody in two weeks. Thank you so much for joining. Everyone, bye. Thank you so much for today, bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>